I want us to open our Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to read verse 18 through 20. And the Word of God says, While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and they followed him. Now reading this passage as a young man, I, I was always so impressed with, with Simon Peter, Andrew and James and John, how they just immediately decided they heard that call and they left everything and they just followed Jesus. And I'm not sure I ever dug in too much to, to actually figure out what the story was. And we give Peter and Andrew a lot of credit for that. But they just left everything, and uh, they deserve credit. They're amazing men of God. But there's much more to the story than just that call. They didn't just, like I might have thought, they didn't just instantly start laying hands on the sick, and they didn't just instantly begin to preach, and they didn't instantly begin to cast out demons. There's a whole lot more to the story. Now, I want us to pray and ask that God would minister through his word right now. I believe that I've got a word for us today that if we'll allow it to, to help us, that we'll leave here changed. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your house. God, to be close to you, to be in your presence, Lord. We don't ever want to take for granted the opportunity to be in your presence. And Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to speak your word. And I pray that your word would touch the hearts and minds of those listening. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. It was the year 30 AD, and Simon, Andrew, James, and John, they were headed to the Sea of Galilee for a night of fishing. And that day, it was the most common to fish at night. The reason being that the nets that they used to fish were made of linen. And if they were to fish during the day, it would be easier spotted by the fish and they would catch nothing. So they fished at night so that the, the fish couldn't see the nets. So they arrive at the Sea of Galilee and they push their boats into the water just after sunset. And what you have to understand about this sea is it, it really, it wasn't even a sea at all. It was a lake. And in, in, in early language, they didn't have a word for lake. But it, it was not a great body of water like a sea it, it spanned a width of about 13 miles and a length of seven miles and for the for this region the economy was driven by the fishing industry the economy was driven by what was caught every night and at any given night there would be up to 230 boats on the water that's a lot of boats on, on this lake 230 boats on the water so that night, I'm certain that when they pushed out into the water, they weren't alone. There were probably hundreds of other boats on the, on the sea, on the lake, trying to, to make their catch. They began to cast their nets as they had done every night before. Casting their nets, banking on the fact that they're going to pull that same net up with fish in it. So over and over, they're casting their nets and they're pulling it back up with nothing. Casting their net, pulling it up again with nothing, no fish. Now, I would imagine frustration began to build throughout the night. Now, listen, I fished for a couple hours and caught nothing, and I got extremely frustrated and just quit. Anybody else been there? <laughs> and I'm no great fisherman, so that's not really uh, uncommon for me. But they, they were stubborn, right? These guys were stubborn. They'd throw their net out, bring it back up, no fish. They did this all night long. All night long, they were trying to catch some fish, but they never gave up. Spending the entire night on the sea, they finally beached their boats that morning with absolutely nothing to show for it but some dirty nets. Now, I can imagine the guys on the, on the shore, right? They're, they're all, they got their nets and they're cleaning their nets. They're probably not saying nothing to each other at this point, right? Right? They pulled an all-nighter with nothing to show for it. They're on the shore. They're cleaning nets, probably talking to themselves, just really frustrated, 
Because you know as soon as somebody says something, somebody's going to blow up, right? It's that kind of night. Y'all ever had a night like that? You, you got nothing done and, and somebody says the wrong thing and you just lose it. I imagine that they were standing there in silence, each of them looking at their nets that, that come back empty and cleaning and mending their nets. And at this point, I'm sure the shoreline was full of boats from other fishermen, men strung across the shoreline, and they were cleaning their nets, mending their nets. Simon and Andrew, they look and they notice a crowd had formed in front of their boats. They look over and it was Jesus. Jesus was there teaching anyone who would listen. The people were so in, in, engaged and engrossed in what he was saying, they began to push in on Jesus, right? They, wanted, they were so hungry for what he had to say. They, they didn't want to miss a word. So they got as close to him as they could. And Jesus, backing up towards the water, turns around and sees that there's nowhere else he could go. And he notices there's a couple of boats there, right? So Jesus looks back and, and he sees this boat. And we'll read here in Luke chapter 5, 1 through 3. It says, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is also the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had got out of them and were washing their nets. Getting, getting into one of the boats, which, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Now, Jesus could have picked probably any number of boats. I'm certain that Simon's boat wasn't the only one on the shore. I imagine he probably could have picked one that was a little better, maybe a little bigger, maybe a little more comfortable. But he didn't. Jesus chose Simon's. Understand that God, he's not looking for the best vessel. He's not looking for the biggest, most appropriate Vessel. He's not looking for the most put together vessel. He's looking for what or who is available. He's searching for an available vessel. I ask you right now, are you somebody who is considered an available vessel for God? You may look at yourself and say, but yeah, but I, I'm not the, the, the most ready for that scenario. I'm not, I'm not the most prepared. Or I don't have all the qualifications but God isn't concerned with your qualifications. He's concerned with your availability. So you have to ask yourself, am I available to God? So he steps onto Simon Peter's boat. And he looks over at him and asks, can you stop what you're doing for a minute and push this boat out into the water? Jesus needed a vessel that was available in order to effectively deliver his word. He looks over at Simon, hey, Simon, can you, can you just sit down your night's frustration? Can you take a minute from, from focusing on the things that didn't go right for a minute and come over here and be with me? Can you come over here for a minute? Can you forget about all the things that's got you frustrated for a second and come up over here in this boat and push me out so I can deliver the word? This, in my opinion, was the first and most important call that Peter answered. This was a call to be in the presence of God. To be in the presence of the Lord. To be near him as he spoke the word of life. Now I have to wonder what went through Peter's mind at this point. What was he thinking? He had no sleep. Just finished an all-nighter with nothing to show for it. <laughs> In a boat, listen, with his brother, all night long with nowhere to go. I only have one point of reference for this. And I can tell you that if I was stuck in a boat all night long with my brother, with nothing to show for it, I'm not sure that I would have been in the best mood. And you're all laughing because you know, you already know, I don't have to say anything. But he's, he's probably not in the best mood, right? I, I would imagine he's, he's not in the best frame of mind at this point. Old Pete was probably a little upset. He, he was probably not ready to be a nice guy, if you know what I'm saying. He was a little, a little frustrated. And his initial thought was probably, what, what is this guy 
what is he doing on my boat? That's, that's my livelihood, right? That, that boat's how I provide for my family. That boat, that's how I support my family. This is, this is, this is what I do for a li- what is he? What is he doing in my boat? How, how dare he disrupt my way of life? And it's funny how God shows up often right in the middle of the things we become the most focused on. But the question is, is do we notice it? Are we over here on the shore just thinking about all the things that's gone wrong and we're, we're mending our nets and we're cleaning our nets and we're thinking about how this world is, is so crazy right now and this last year and a half has been awful and I'm, I'm so distracted by the things that have got me bothered and the things that are currently happening in my life that I don't even notice that Jesus is standing in the boat. He's standing in my boat and he's asking me to just come be in his presence. He's asking me to put away the distraction, to drop the things that have got me bound and the things that have got me worried and the things that has got me concerned. And he's saying, can you just come over here and spend time with me? Just push me out in your boat and sit here with me as I deliver the word, as I speak the word of life. And I wonder if, if, if we're not paying attention to God's call for us, for you, to go over and spend time with him. And read his Bible. Brother Jay Lytle delivered a, a, a masterpiece of a message to our young people this Wednesday night talking about the importance of the word of God. And I wonder, do, do we ignore him in our boat with, with this word of God and his voice speaking to us? We let distractions get in the way. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I'll allow the things that have got me frustrated. I'll end my day at work and I'll come home and I'm tired, I'm exhausted, and I'm thinking about tomorrow. And then I neglect my, my, my time with God, being in his presence, reading his word, getting in touch with the Holy Spirit. And I just wonder at this point, had Peter allowed distraction to bother him, he would have missed the most important call of his life and that's to be in God's presence. What if Peter's response would have been different? What if he would have been, what if he would have been different? He would have said, I, I, I can't right now. I'm over here. I've got to clean this net. If I don't clean this net, it's going to rot. If I don't clean this net, if I don't, I don't take care of my problems right now, if I don't take care of what's going on right now, then I'm not going to be able to catch fish tomorrow. God, hey, hold on. i got to put in this overtime. I don't have time to go to that prayer meeting. I got to put in this overtime. I got to pick up this extra shift. I don't have time to be in the revival service. What if Peter would have said that? What if that would have been Peter's attitude? I don't have time. I've got to take care of what's going on. I got to provide. The Bible doesn't say that Peter said anything in response to Jesus. It said that Peter's response was to simply go over, push the boat out, sit there on the boat and listen to Jesus teach. Luke 5, 4 and 5 says, And when he had finished speaking, he had said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. Peter answered the call from Jesus. That call was nothing more than Jesus being in his vessel and Peter being in his presence. In response to that answer call, Jesus wanted to say thank you in only a way that Jesus could. Jesus looks at Peter, who had just finished a night full of fruitless fishing, and says, go out into the lake and cast your nets. You're going to catch a ton of fish. Peter says, I, I've been at this all night, Jesus. I've been doing this all night, and I've caught nothing. But because you said it, I'll do it. Now, you all know how we would have been. This is, our response probably would have been a little different. Or maybe just me. I think, I think it would have been, okay, Jesus, I, I love your enthusiasm. I appreciate it. You're so positive. You know, you know what I've gone through all night long. And here you are, you're, you're just encouraging me one last time to go cast this net. And, you know, you're, you're a carpenter. And it's cute that you think that today in the, in the broad daylight I could cast this net and catch fish. But, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fisherman, and I've been doing this a long time. And I, I, I know how to do this, and, and, 
anybody who knows anything about fishing knows that you don't go out during the day and cast a net. And I, I appreciate it, but I, I tell you what, Jesus, thank you for your suggestion. But maybe, you know what I'll do? I'll come back tonight when it makes the most sense. I'll come back later when it makes the most sense in my mind to do what I think is right. That's how I think some of us probably, you know, we would have responded like, that's how I've always provided for my family. It doesn't make sense for me to give a little extra in the offering because this is how I've always done it. It doesn't make sense for me to do that because that's not the way I've always done it. What you're asking me to do just doesn't make any sense, and I'm, I'm going to just stick to what I know. Appreciate it, though. Thanks. Some of us might have been that way, but thank God that Peter was him. Peter listened, and he obeyed. Luke chapter 5, 6 through 11 says, And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled the boat, filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish and th that they had taken. And it's also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land... They left everything and followed him. Jesus says to Simon, do not be afraid. I know who you are. I understand that you have sin in your life. I'm not looking for a perfect vessel. I'm not looking for somebody who's, who's done everything right. I'm just looking for somebody to come be in my presence and follow me. I wonder if we, if we give ourselves a sentence that says that we can't do anything for God because of what we've done. And Jesus is looking at you today and he's saying, do not be afraid. Come to me. That's all I want is I want you in my presence. I want you to come and be with me just like he did with Peter. And it was at this point the decision to follow Jesus was made. The call to follow Jesus was answered. But what did that mean for the disciples? Did they instantly go out and start preaching the message? Did they go out and lay hands on the sick? Did they cast out demons? Were they instantly in, in, a, in a status situation where they're out evangelizing? No. I believe the church, as a church, we've always put so much emphasis on what our calling is. I know for a fact that this very question has consumed some of you. I just, I don't, I don't know what my calling is yet. I don't know what I'm supposed to do for God yet. What is it, God, that you have for me? What is my calling? Am I called to preach? Am I, am I called to be a worship leader? God, am I, am I called to pastor? Am I called to evangelize? Am I, am I called to the missions field? We get so wrapped up in that and not knowing it that we get frustrated sometimes and, and get upset. I'm about to help all of you out. This is going to help everybody today. You want to know what your calling is? It's simply to be in his presence. To be in the presence of the almighty God. Understand that the disciples, they did leave everything to follow him. They left everything. They were able to, but, but they did that so they could be in the presence of God. And know that where we're at today, we don't have to go physically look for him. But because of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit of God, we can be in his presence every day, anywhere you are, everywhere you go. We just got to go get in his presence. It's not enough to just come to church on Wednesday and on, on, on Thursday night Bible study, young people, and on Sunday morning. But we've got to be in his presence every day because this flesh can't handle a day off from being in God's presence. He's calling for us to be in his presence. Look what happened to the disciples right after they said they would follow him. Luke 5, 12 through 14. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, 
You can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded, for a proof to them. See, Jesus could have at that point just healed the man and told him he was clean and to go on, but he decided to use this opportunity to teach the disciples a lesson that there's an importance in spiritual authority. He told the man to go show yourself to the priest, just like Moses had told the children of Israel, in order to be deemed clean. Understand the disciples were just there. They were there in the presence. They did nothing. Jesus did everything, but he taught them. There was preparation in the presence of God. Shortly after that, Jesus heals the man taken with the palsy. You all, most of you know the story, dropped from the roof. Jesus forgives him for his sins. And then he reprimands the, the scribes and the Pharisees, and then he tells the man to get up and walk. What did, this, what did the disciples do? They were there. They were learning in his presence. The Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6, he looks at the disciples in verse 20, and he says this, Blessed are you who are poor, for your, yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you when people hate you and when, you, when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their families did to the prophets. Jesus was teaching them, just as he's teaching us, when we decide to answer the call to be in his presence. Answering the call to be in his presence means that we get in this word. We read this word every day. His word is the word of life. It's full of life. It's important. This is how we learn from God. And then we get in the spirit of God and get in tune in touch with the Holy Ghost every day. Every day. Luke 7, Jesus raises a man from the dead and it said about the disciples that they went with him. They were just in his presence. And it was finally in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, where Jesus sends the disciples out to preach and to heal the sick. That call to preach and heal the sick would have never happened had the disciples not first answered the call to be in his presence. The call to be in his presence was the most important thing they could have ever done because they learned there was preparation in the presence of God. And I wonder how often we give God we give God our time. Genuinely give God our time. How often do we set aside the nets, the things that distract us? How often do we set aside those things that, that are weighing on our mind and, and genuinely give God our time? Think about it for a minute. Think about it. We give, we give so many other things our time. Social media, work, television, whatever it may be. We give so many things our time. How much time are we giving God every day? How often do we get in the presence of God every day? I preached a message to our students a couple weeks ago about having a Mount Horeb experience. In Exodus chapter 3, we find Moses tending to his father-in-law's flock. He's far from home, maybe even weeks or months away from home when he has his burning bush experience. What we find is at that moment, Moses was far from anything that was comfortable. He was alone. And the Bible says he turned aside when he noticed the burning bush. He turned aside. That just means he stopped what he was doing veered from the direction he was headed, turned aside and faced the bush. He faced God. And I have to ask, how often do we get alone with God? I don't know if God can truly speak to us until we've sat and turned our phones off, taken our watches off, and just spent time with God. Look, I've done it. I'm going, to play this, I'm going to play this prayer music on my phone. I'm going to sit it right here on this desk. And then the, the alerts start going off, right? The alerts start going off. 
And I, I'm, I'm looking at my social media. Oh, I got a like on that. And, you know, I, okay, I'll put it down and get back in the, into the prayer. We've got to disconnect from all those distractions. I have, to, I have to set my phone aside. I've got to take my watch off. I've got to make sure that I'm in the presence of God because it's in those moments that God speaks to us and gives us our other callings. Some of you are going to get into the presence of God in your homes and he's going to inspire you to speak to somebody and create a disciple that's in our world today. Somebody's going to get in the presence of God and God's going to inspire you to teach a Bible study to somebody and they're going to become a disciple of Christ. Somebody's going to get in the presence of God and answer that call and God is going to be able to do great things through you. But the worst thing you could do is neglect the call to be in His presence. I want us all to come to the altar today. We need those moments with God where we turn off the distractions. We need those moments with God where we stop what we're doing and we face Him. We need those moments with God. That's where He calls us. That's how He speaks to us. It takes more than a Sunday and a Wednesday relationship. It takes an everyday relationship. When was the last time you were alone with God? Truly alone with Him. I feel the power of the Holy Ghost right now. In Jesus' name. I'm challenging you this morning to answer the call to be in His presence. I'm challenging you right now. This wasn't a fire and brimstone message by any means, but it is a call to be in the presence of God. God can't use us and minister through us unless we have a relationship with Him every day. Every day. Understand that He's right here right now and He's in your boat. And He's asking you to turn away from your distractions. Turn away from the things that's got you bothered right now. Take a minute and go be in His presence. I'm asking everybody right now to find a place to pray. And I'm challenging you right now to get alone with God. I know we're in an altar filled with people, but this is your moment to get along with God and get in His presence and allow Him to speak to you. Allow the Holy Ghost to move through you. If you're somebody that's here today and you don't have the Holy Ghost, there's ministry, ministry staff across this front. We're happy to pray with you, happy to work through that with you. The Holy Ghost is here and it's for everybody. He's not looking for a perfect vessel. He's not looking for somebody who's got it all together. But he's looking for somebody who is available and willing to answer the call to be in his presence. Come on, church, can we pray? Can we pray right now? God, God, I pray that we would enter your presence right now, Jesus. Come on, find that alone place with God right now. Get into his presence.